Crevice Gardens, this wonky name, which is not immediately available to the public, I certainly have been finding. Um, and they are, it is a style of rock gardening that is essentially paving your raised bed with rocks and then planting the plants in those tiny little things. Um, do, have any, do any of you have weeds in the cracks in your sidewalk? Yes. Anybody <laughs> notice that? Yes. Does anyone think that those plants grow better? Yeah. Even plants from the garden? Well, this is creating that environment and deliberately and aesthetically for those plants. Um, really, there it is. Um, oh, I need the clicker, don't I? I didn't lose the clicker, did I? Before? Mm -hmm. there we go. Have you ever heard of anybody planting those strips along the crevices in dry blocks to put exactly what they wanted in there? Is there weeds in that funny um, It's happened accidentally, but with plants, and then they leave the plants. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, I do know one fellow from Salt Lake who's yeah. working with it. Um, so a crevice garden, apparently, allegedly, it started in the UK. The first documentation was, maybe it was even fairer, but it started in the UK and allegedly was perfected in the Czech Republic. And the pictures I've seen of rock gardens in the Czech Republic seems like most of the rock gardens in the CR are crevice gardens, so I'll, I'll agree with that um, until I can prove it. And a crevice garden can take on many, many forms. It's really a concept that we can build into a formula, but that, that formula can be expressed in so many different ways. The first one I ever saw was a Paul Spriggs place in Victoria, which is a, a low moundy thing that's absolutely gorgeous. <coughs> it's totally beautiful. Um, actually, I lied. The first one I saw was at the Betty Ford Alpine Garden in Vail, um, where because they're basically alpine in elevation, you saw this tin, I hope. No, you didn't get to go. Oh, you have to come back then. It's only two hours from Denver. Um, a great place to grow alpines, and the plants are flourishing in those cracks. Um, but the nearest thing in most American gardening culture that we have to the crevice garden is the dry stack stone wall, which is not unheard of, throwing campanulas or semper beetles in the dry stack stone wall. Um, and even in gardens, like this is Panayoti's place in Denver, he has this big dry stacked wall with plants. Most of those are, are plants that have seeded themselves nowadays. Um, but a crevice garden doesn't have to be much. I think, by definition, two rocks could be a crevice garden, because you still have a crack between them. And when I started my horrible little crevice garden in my apartment, this is all the rocks I had. It's bigger now, but I, you know, I figured with, with, half, with a dozen rocks, I could still call it a crevice garden. It's a little cracks. Um, and it can, it can go as naturally as you want, where this big stone on the left is matched with these other two stones and looking quite natural with this wild collected ponderosa pine, um, to something very convoluted that is obviously man-made. It's a crack. Um, this style is probably quite appropriate for you guys. I'm highly going to encourage you to try this stuff. And this is easy. This is what? Uh, eight pieces of slate all jammed together and buried. Some are extremely convoluted. This is obviously a man-made thing. Those, those are um, uh, rock fence posts. So something really quite showy that's very naturalistic. This is my, my mentor outside of Salt Lake City. He's a, a dryland native fiend expert. And he grows everything um, and does it quite well. And his, his garden, although it's fairly low mound, is still a crevice garden because it's solidly paved with rocks. My first little crevice garden was, was cute. It was very small, like six feet, maybe, maybe. Um, they can, because of their um, flexibility, they can be built in to be very accessible. Like you can sit on this wall of a sand bed. So this is actually a crevice garden in a sand bed as a raised bed. Um, it's extremely accessible and easy to get into. Um, so this one that was designed quite well with that in mind, where uh, Lee, um, Lee Curtis over in Denver, she can sit on this wall. She built this for Louisias alone. She built this whole garden just to grow Louisias. Turns out everything else likes to grow there. Um, and actually the thing's very skinny. It's only uh, maybe four feet wide, but it looks deep here. We're looking at the broad side of it. And it turns out Louisias love it. They're reseeding, they're spilling off. They're doing very well. Um, and even the naturalistic ones are fairly easy to access. Um, access can be planned into them. Um, even our rare and special plants will come up in the cracks. The plants love this stuff. They absolutely love it. Even in my clay in Grand Junction, this little hybrid showed up. Um, plants that you've planted deliberately do incredibly well. And how can you leave that without breaking your ankle? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've, the properly placed rocks. There are ways of hiding the rocks for steps. Um, or you can lay down or sit on it, lean back. Uh, you know, 
as uh, Tony was talking when we were out there, that designing a garden for maintenance is everything. Because you spend more time maintaining the garden than, than going through it. I'm, I'm a young fellow, and so is Paul, so we're okay with these kind of overgrown, that, well, I don't even know what to call that, these big bouldery looking things that uh, you have to step up on top of. So we're okay with doing that, squatting down and getting in there. Do you wear knee pads? Um, I started this year, I do. But most of the time when I'm weeding, I just I, if, if it's tall enough, I'll just sit there and weed like that um, and leave enough open space when I'm not sitting on a plant. Um, otherwise, if a crevice garden just raised, it's like a raised bed and I can just reach over and pull the weeds there. Um, of the advantages, one of them is reduced weeds. Now, tap-rooted weeds are still love a crevice garden, but the non-tap-rooted weeds seem to be much reduced. Um, because there's so many rocks and so few spaces, there's just less space for weeds. So if you fill them with your own plants, you will very rarely have weeds. Just by simple displacement, that's one of the advantages, is the lack of weeds. Obviously, drainage is huge here. You get to control what kind of soil you have, so you can control drainage there. And also, there's surface drainage. When rain hits it, first that first flush of water goes right off the top. So this is drainage, 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 built right in. Say, and, and also aspect control, like this is facing east, and on the other side it's facing west. Um, and we can very much control what kind of shade and sun these plants have since they're short. Uh, you know, they're not growing over the top of it, and they are subject to that shadow. Are there any little questions so far? Okay. And in the winter, the microclimates become really obvious when the sunny sides of rocks um, melt off and the shaded sides of rocks have snow on them. And I think in the winter, they're also very beautiful. I'll spray this garden again. Um, between the evergreen plants and the rocks, which are always there. Even if you trial a bunch of plants and kill a bunch, you still have this beautiful rock feature. Again, the south-facing bits get exposed, and the north-facing bits are still buried in snow. You have really good control. Now, I know you guys don't have quite the snow that uh, Colorado does, but the aspect control is still um, very valid for you guys since the sun will be lower in the winter and that shadow will get longer and you'll have a place for maybe a really fussy evergreen that would burn you could put it down on that north side um, to hide it and again the plants love it um, these are all western natives so I don't expect you to want to try to grow these they're all some oddballs Greya, Townsendia, Spaculata um, the seedlings of your own plants tend to show up in the crevices which is nice and kids are really attracted to them, I think just because they're rocks and they're fun. And it's, it gives them some adventure. And what you see here is, you see these little tents? These are tents over my new plantings in this rock garden when it was new. And I think the kids had to check out, what are all these tents about? And since then, I've, I've, got, um, I've got, toy, got toys showing up in the garden. I have these little marbles that are appearing, and little toy elephants and toy dinosaurs um, in my rock garden. I love it. At first, I had that territory, territorial thing of, oh, what's, oh that's cute. You know? <laughs> so, so now I'm putting toys out in my rock garden. Look what happened. And uh, this is definitely not a plant for you guys, but um, this, this uh, fringe sage, one of our western natives, they usually don't grow but a few inches per year. And in my crevice garden, it got big, like two feet in one season, which just blows me away. Um, and it's a plant that's very, uh, even for us, can't take water from the top very well. But the roots were very moist, buried under this 600 pound rock. So um, it got exactly what it needed and just grew faster than I've ever seen them grow before. Um, and that is literally a foot of my foot, and it's one foot long. Um, it's pretty big. The other big advantage to a crevice garden is um, the plants that we're planting get smaller. This isn't a crevice garden, by the way. Plants that we're planting get smaller and the surface area of the garden increases because it's, it's gaining topography. So Linda, our, our vice president of the Denver group, the Rock Garden Club, um, went from having a regular rock garden um, with maybe 30 plants to a crevice garden, which 30 plants just got swallowed up in no time. I think she has two or three flats, which is 36 flats. That's about 100 plants in her first planting. And, and they're not even beginning to be full. The nice thing is any plant from the regular rock garden world, once it's into a crevice garden, tends to get dwarfed a little bit. Um, with the exception of woodies, we have to be careful with those. I'll talk about that more later. But um, 
Linda's eight, we've got a full full spectrum from primroses down here on the very north aspect and Louisias going up to, up to cactus on top where it's super dry because she has this full range and again you'll see this better outside of, of different um, of lighter to heavier soils and uh, less to more moisture. Her, her soil around here is clay and this absorbs water and holds it and so there's plenty of water down here that keeps these guys cool and watered around the edges. But you can see she has all this planting space now. And she's been going to town piling plants in there. I'm really excited to see how it goes for Linda. And here's, this is the key to crevice gardening. This is what it's all about. Campanula unspecifica. Um, number one, growing here in a crevice has these long tap roots, um, who are, and it, it accommodates the, uh, the fibrous roots down there in a deep, cool location. The deeper you go, the cooler it is. Um, whereas this little guy with the gravel top dressing, um, the roots are all just up here. They don't need to go very deeply. Um, and as, as well as the top, so the gravel is heating up and drying the surface to some extent, but this is heating it up and drying it much better because there's no room right here for water to sit. When it rained, that water had to pass by. It had to go away or go down. Um, so in a crevice garden, the plants are getting watered from a deep water source. You know, usually the clay or topsoil, whatever's underneath of the crevice garden is, is really what's watering the whole place. The other advantage to this crevice situation with these stones and this compared to this gravel is if we turn it on the side, this little plant's not going to stay there. It's going to wash away. So again, our topography gives us more room. Um, and you know, this is drainage right here. When it rains, it doesn't even I mean, if the rain were coming from, say, this side, then the rain would never actually touch this. It might, it's going to end up soaking into the soil um, of the greater crevice garden, but it will not actually hit that plant. If the rain's coming in from that side, you could use this to your advantage. I understand your rains actually tend to come from one direction more than the other. I mean, for us, if it does rain, we go out and dance it, and we don't notice <laughs> where it's coming from. We're just glad it's there. Um, and for us, that means I can overwinter things like this little Mexican um, cactus that I could never even dream of overwintering before. It's a tiny thing that reblooms, so I'm really jazzed to have Memolaria ritii in my garden. Didn't think there was any chance, no snowflakes chance in Hades that it was going to make it. Um, and for us, this guy is not easy, um, Gentiana caulis, because it's just too hot for us. But on a north aspect, between rocks, it seems to grow for us. You can grow anything. I'm kidding. Never mind. This is a tropical plant. No chance. <laughs> Just a joke. Um, our, our African mesums, we even have problems with them getting too wet when you have cool days, rainy days, whatever. But in a crevice garden, much, much better. I think you guys in a crevice garden should try. Try the mesums again and see what happens. You know, kill a few to find out if I'm wrong. Um, and it's, it's not unheard of that in nature, the plants are growing in crevices. So it's, this is not a foreign concept we're imposing on them. It might be for some species, but other species like this Telesonix, which is a, a heuchera essentially, from certain peaks in the Rockies, grow in crevices. That's where they grow. That's where they're endemic to. So it's not, it's uh, nothing foreign to them being shoved into a crack in our garden. And uh, are you growing any of the Hymenopsis acalus? Mm -hmm. How do they perform for you? Any good? Seed all over. Do they? Yeah, seed all over. Awesome. Yeah. Flower These guys are native to our eight inches of preset. Wow. I actually knew them in the trade before I realized that they grew in my hometown. I didn't, I didn't realize that until I was out one spring. They're, they're, um, they're uh, uh, take advantage of the moments, what do they do? They're, uh, um, opportunistic. Oppor they're opportunistic bloomers to the rain. So if it rains in the summer, they'll bloom. But Hymenoxus is a, very often a crevice grower in its native place, the Grand Junction. But Disadvantages. There can be disadvantages aesthetically, like my friend Trish in Denver has this very big stucco house and tons of brick and concrete around the house. She doesn't want any more hard surfaces. She doesn't want anything more hard and rocky, so she doesn't have a crevice garden. She won't have a rock garden. It's just too much rock, too much hard, too hot, too dry for her. And rocks, um, they cost money. And, and initially, it, it seems like you're burying a lot of your rocks. You really are. You'll see outside that we're only exposing a small part of each rock. So per pound, you're burying all of your money, as, as one crevice gardener puts it. She says you're burying 90% of that cash. Um, 
Could you get inexpensive bricks or things to put underneath instead, just to hold up? You could, but at that rate, we, we might as well just use soil underneath if it's going to be completely buried. Um, I suppose when you're building your crevice garden, you could uh, be aware of which rocks, what part of the face you're, you're standing up. And I have sort of a cross-section illustration I'll show where you can kind of fake parts of it and not use so much rock. <coughs> Um, so it is a bigger initial investment than just a regular rock garden with regular uh, materials. Maybe if you priced it out, a ton of rocks is cheaper than a ton of plants. Yes, <laughs> my friend, there you go. I like we we the plants. I love it. And an another challenge, I'm, I could call it a disadvantage, um, is that physics have to be right. The rocks have to sit in such a way that, at least for us, frost heaving, or erosion or whatnot is not going to knock them down. So they have to be in a sustainable position physically or engineered or they could fall over. So that they've got to be engineered right. And that's that's a disadvantage. If you put in part of a crevice garden incorrectly, it'll start kind of splaying open and rocks will be falling down. But these things, well, I'll show this again outside, but these guys on the edges, that's only a third of the rock sticking up. Because these guys up here are holding up, going to hold all this sand coming in up here. Um, they would just topple over like dominoes getting blown from one side. So these are buried like these deep footers on the edges to keep their neighbors from falling over. And how on earth do you garden in a space that big? Like, does, does anyone agree this is just not possible to plant something here, right? What do you think? Um, we'll see about that. The other disadvantage might be that it takes forever to place the rocks as compared to a regular rock garden where you have a free mound of soil and you can just place rocks wherever you want and move them around. Um, Maybe it's taking, actually, uh, this whole rock arranging, morning to night, this garden took three days. But I tell you what, we had a blast. Randy and I had such a ball. I don't think that's a disadvantage. That was a lot of fun. Um, so just give yourself more time to build a Carlos garden. It might take a while, um, but it's very well worth it. And hopefully we'll be an investment that these guys are enjoying for many years, many, many years. And that's the little Matterhorn. I'm going to jokingly call it Mount Shin. The, the shins are the, the people who, who own it. That's um, there's another chunk of chunk of it off the picture here, but that's this garden was uh, four and a half tons of rock, which actually didn't cost them too much. I think they wound up spending a little under two grand for the whole rock garden, including me, and, and, and I charge well to, to drive to another city to build a rock garden. Um, so if you want to build a rock garden, what I'd say to you is to go out and. Um, Let's see. No, I'd say select so well. I might, might, might be backwards from my program here, but that's all right. Um, okay, I guess is to, to get inspired to go look at natural rock formations if you can. Look them up online from the Mediterranean or from the Alps or whatever. This is not far from my place on the Grand Mesa. Um, one of my favorite rock uh, uh, rock situations. It's not far from me. And I don't know why I'm so excited about these rocks. Maybe it's the wild horses and everybody. I don't know. But this chunk of rocks and the way it looks with the plants around it and the grass in front inspired me um, to make a rock garden. My little tiny thing out of the same <laughs> sandstone. Not the same effect. This is not grass. And those are not wild horses, but whatever. Um, and this situation in the Caucasus, you saw a similar slide, inspired me to design uh, Mrs. Leanne Huntington's garden using a basalt as well. Just the way the rocks arranged and how the plants were growing in it. Um, and another mound from near where I live, um, this sort of sun-beaten heap of stone with a Mormon tea, that's an ephedra, and a little town Sandia daisy. We have a, it's a little, uh, little uh, stemless daisy that's common throughout the West. This is a, in a natural rock garden situation, so it gave me ideas um, to build this one, my, my main desert crevice garden. And in its first year, the plants were doing pretty well, and in its second year, things were doing really well. And this is when I was totally sold on this, when things from Mexico overwintered and Indian paintbrush, which I've never been able to grow before. Indian paintbrush do great in this crevice garden situation. And, uh, and buckwheats, which can rot in our gardens with too much water. I can grow buckwheats, I can grow, I've got a couple manzanitas in here even. Um, it's a, now there are different plants for you guys that you're going to find to grow in the crevice garden, but that's why I'm so excited to share it with you guys, is that there's a whole world of, of plants to try now, because we don't know what's going to grow in your crevice garden. You can let Ralston kill a bunch of plants for you and, and learn from them. Again, nature provides inspiration, like this low, moundy limestone in Utah. 
pretty good inspiration for Mike Kitchen's work at DBG. I think you saw this, Tim. And the snow it's, oh, and the snow. <laughs> this, I think this is just gorgeous. And the plants are going to town in this expanded shale and, mm -hmm. and crevice situation. There's only one book on the subject. Um, other, all the other ones are in Czech. Um, you can order this online from the AGS, the British uh, the, uh, Alpine Garden Society. Uh, I think it winds up being about 20 bucks if you order it online from the Brits. Um, first thing to do is pick position. A place with a lot of leaves coming off of trees isn't great because the leaves will smooth the plants. And um, tree roots can be an advantage or disadvantage depending on whether you want it drier or warmer, or drier or wetter. Um, but to, to figure out design-wise, uh, we stuck this, this ladder here just to see what the mass was going to look like for the shins to see, is that right to have your little Matterhorn in the middle of the front yard? And we decided, yes, that, that, that works. So, uh, you know, we, we had the rope laying up and the ladder. Pick your materials. <laughs> Lots of materials will work. Lots of materials. I hold that any kind of stone or car, no matter brand, will work as a rock garden. From basalt, slivered basalt, surface basalt, to a sandstone, surface sandstone. This might be the most classic shape of rock to use. Um, and even moundy, lumpy things have a little bit of a strata. And you'll see the strata outdoors, how we, how we arrange those things. And even really round stuff can be done. There's still crevices right between where they meet each other. And it makes them easy to plant. Round, dumpy stones still change the microclimate and still change the water flow and the sun. Um, they're still affecting the plants, these round, dumpy stones. And I've heard about a Dutch fellow who used recycled concrete for this sphere, like a globe. Have, has anybody, have you seen it, Tim? Or? Oh, I'd love to see it. Um, I, I think we could do a lot with concrete, as long as it didn't break down too quickly. Recycled concrete could be a really fun crevice garden, fence combination, wall combination, I'm not sure. But when you're moving great big rocks, be careful with your back. Don't be afraid to use tools. Slow down, Tim. Oh my goodness. I've seen it yesterday. Um, don't carry rocks that are too big for you, like arches in Utah. Um, use tools available to you, like a rock bar or a college student. <laughs> and uh, start digging. Um, I like to start with the outside, the perimeter, so I know where I'm working from, and clean up that topsoil and just mound it up. It's going to get very. And then um, I sink the first stones, those foundation stones, very deeply in the outside to just contain everything and also let you know where you're going to wind up on the other side and just start building it. And it's a lot easier to just start with those and get them going. I think even in the book, that's how I recommend doing it. Um, and uh, we got the outside first. And then um, I'm going to recommend to you guys to use straight sand. That's what's being used in wetter climates. Straight, pure sand, no organic material. We'll talk more about that later. Um, straight, pure sand, or as a lady in Calgary does, oh no, <laughs> yeah, bones, use bones. Um, <laughs> you can see that these guys on top are smaller rocks and they're shallower, but they will give the overall impression of one big cracked chunk of stone. Notice the stones on the outside are deeply buried. To take the weight, the force of all of this in here is forcing outside, so it's got to be backed up somehow. You have to have the big, strong stones, some big, strong stones in there. And then this sand, a lighter free draining mix allows you plants, plants that are mulched on the surface with big stones whose roots pass through something sandy and loose and if they want to, they can get into the deep stuff. I believe that if we pulled apart old crevice gardens, most of the roots would be right on that interface, is my guess. Because they've got the airy, oxygen, oxygenated sand and then the wet, nutritious clay. So that I, I'll bet you that most of the roots wind up in that position. A lot of roots wind up in the cracks, too. Um, and then going on, we just go further for moving inside of the garden. And uh, I'm interlocking them here for strength. And also on the outside, the crevices should be tighter so that the soil doesn't wash out and go away. Um, that's what I learned with my first little crevice trough. All the sand washed away because I didn't have tight crevices on the sides. Um, my new little crevice troughs are growing very well. And I'm able to grow things I've never grown before. Um, Rimrock paintbrush and stemless penstemon. I think it's the size of a quarter from Wyoming. Um, never been able to grow it before, but in a crevice trough. First time I've ever had success. And miniature carnations, why not? It worked. Uh, vertical is possible. It's, it's totally possible. You just have to take a little more time with it and, uh, and work with them. You'll notice the crevices here are pretty tight, and then up on top, 
Some of them are so loose, there's actually a small <coughs> space in there where you can plant bigger plants and, and just plants that don't need a tighter crevice. And uh, we'll quickly cover um, keeping a strata aligned. This is a traditional check thing, but it keeps it looking organized and natural. Nature likes this order. It happens a lot. So we're, we're being inspired by nature to keep the strata straight. And we do it in a garden still, and it, it winds up the overall impression is that you want something to look like a great big rock that hit the ground so hard or has been eroded that it's splitting. So that's what I'm shooting for, is to make something look like one big rock. And my imperfections, because I can't get the stones perfectly tight together, are where we'll plant the plants. And the other secret is to get the faces to match up with each other, which will show up much easier outside. But that's my secret to making the rock gardens look natural, is that if, if these two rocks didn't line up, and that crap was uneven, it wouldn't really look like one eroded stone that broke into two. But those are two very different stones. And they look like they, uh, they might have been one stone that broke in half. And here, since uh, Randy's putting in his irrigation, it really, it really exaggerated the fact that all these faces line up with each other. Which seems kind of convoluted and a little bit too much like masonry, but darn it, overall, it looks like a natural feature. Because in nature, it would have been a river or a creek or persistent wind that kept blowing in one place and, and eroding the rocks down all in the same way. And if you'll, you'll bear with me, you can see the face of this rock, and this rock, and this rock, and this rock. They're all lining up fairly well in a relatively parallel plane. That, that plane is starting to curve towards the top of the, of the rock garden. That's really the big secret to making a natural looking crevice garden. And overall it starts to look like this. Even rocks that are different colors. Um, and maybe that's why the pictures don't always come out really well. You can see it better in person because you can see that the mass is a unified shape and in, in pictures it's, it's a little harder to tell since the different colors are wrong. But it works. So this is, this is a garden where all the stones have been set in the sand, which is very easy to work with. And then what we'll do is come in afterwards oops, and pile in sand in the final crevices. Now just arranging your faces doesn't make it look natural. What's wrong here is that all the rocks are the same size. It's a, it's a dish ex example that I made. Um, and because they're all the same size, it just looks unnatural. It looks wrong. Now, if I had a couple bigger stones, it would start to look natural, a variety. And whatever you do, don't do this. I feel like it's Morse code for no, no, no. It's rock space, rock space, rock space. And this is what Reginald Ferrer, the, our British uh, rock garden king, what he said was it's the plum bun system or the date pudding system, which is spacing the rocks out between each other, having no relationship with them. And this doesn't, it doesn't look natural that way. That's not how rocks show up in nature. You have a cluster over here and an open space over here. That's what he says. This is probably infringing on some ancient copyrights by putting this up here. Don't tell anybody. A more tolerable way of using humpity dumpties. These are technical terms, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> In nature, despite big rocks, little rocks, little rocks, there's still an organization happening with the strata, <coughs> since that's how they were formed. Sometimes nature provides strata that looks too convoluted for our tastes. That's in nature. That's way out in the mountains somewhere. It happens to be how the rocks fell. In future, I would like to figure out how to do this in a rock garden. But this is in Armenia. Um, and to me, it looks beautiful and unified, because there's a secret order to all of these rocks right there. Despite the rocks not fitting together, because they weren't all, they were all one piece, but they got jumbled up and jostled around. And by some physics, I don't know why. One day I'll figure this out and try to make a rock garden like that. But that's why this looks right. It's all those, those secret arrangements of those rocks. This isn't how we're going to build the crevice garden outside, but just think about that artistically. What you wind up having is this. It is a uh, hump of sand covered in rocks with little spaces to put in more sand, which we do. Another layer of sand, and watering it in, we'll settle it down and find, find the gaps better before you put the gravel on. We'll love to do that today, some watering. And uh, as soon as that sand is in those cracks, it's strong enough to stand on top of it. If you've done it, that's a good test, is to wiggle the rocks. So if they don't move, it's strong enough to survive. And so uh, before I had even finished putting the sand, Linda was up on top hunting cactus on her cryo's garden. Go for it, Linda. Um, another trick a person can use is mixing sand and gravel half and half. Again, no organic material, but, the, but sharp gravel seems to keep the sand from moving as much. I'm still not entirely sure why, um, but you have to have some top dressing 
and especially you guys with all of your rain, you'll have to have top dressing because what makes sand move is the physical action of rain hitting it. So if you can actually keep the rain from splashing the surface, you can keep the sand in any shape you can, you can form as long as it's covered by that gravel top dressing. Um, but choose gravel top dressing that matches your rocks. After rain, it might betray that they really do not look like they belong together. This pink with this orange is just not on, at least I think so. Here, here's a, a, a trick, or a, excuse me, an, an experiment where we watered gravel covered sand. This is just a heap of sand with sharp gravel on top and a heap of sand with no sharp gravel on top. And just the churning action of water splashed the sand away, <coughs> whereas here it absorbed all of it. This is going to be a huge key for you guys. And, and even if you just build a uh, rock garden or a sand bed and don't pave it with rocks like this, just cover it in sharp gravel and keep it pinned down. If you've ever heard of Peter Korn in Sweden, he's a famous gardener around the world, travels the world lecturing. He grows everything in pure sand to start with, just pure sand covered in rocks on top. And he gets, I don't know how much water, tons of water, like 80 inches or something a year. They get a lot of water where he's at. Um, and uh, if you have the, uh, if you're able to get gravel of different sizes, that seems to look a lot more natural in my book. And another way to get smaller pieces, at least in a few places, within reason, is to break um, leftover stones you've got for chips to fill in. There you have your, your rock garden. Yay! Yeah. It's covered in gravel. Question? Is there an ideal height for these structures? Or just uh, not really. Just like I, a think, few feet? Um, I think the higher you go, the more variation in drainage, obviously. So I'm building them higher than I've ever seen anyone build them. Okay. But that's only because the physics has to be right. Okay. Lower is obviously safer. Um, uh, stability-wise, mm -hmm. um, but I, my clients also like something dramatic because it's unseen of, it's totally, it's new and unheard of and that's fun and I think it gets really dry on top um, and moist on the bottom. So yeah, there's not an ideal height. I try to go as high as I can within reason. Um, uh, Stinik, the, the Czech Kravis gardener who wrote the book, he tries to keep them low and kind of moundy and soft and let the plants create the height. Um, now that you have this crevice garden, I'll cover planting and then I'll be done in only 10 minutes over. Thank you for uh, putting up with me. And you finally get to do what you've been wanting to do all along. You don't have to wait anymore. You can eat the tomato and plant your plants. Um, oh man, I'll tell you about the winter story later when I'm not running over on a lecture time. But um, we bear root the plants and we find the hole to put them in, or create the hole with, with tools, which are probably not a regular trowel, a hori hori to a butter knife, to chop sticks, and we'll talk about that more outside. Um, and we take the bare root plant into the hole. These natural plants have long natural tap roots. So ideally, we'd be able to grow our plants with long tap roots, but we can't always do that. So we've got to bare root them and jiggle out the roots and get them as deep as possible. Um, I showed this in the Caucasus. Um, lecture. This is what was in, wrapped up inside of a two-inch pot, and once it got unwound, it was 18 inches long. Mm. Um, and, and that was that was something to, to, to plant. I'll tell you what, um, or a dowel. This is just bamboo dowel to plant this drava that was growing in a two-inch pot. Note the roots are a little longer than the pot. Um, the guy, I was, <laughs> not, I did not invent bare root planting, but I got telling Mike about this over and over and over again, and he says, oh, "All right, I'll finally try it." He's an amazing gardener. He's grown everything. And now they're doing it at DBG. So uh, he's picking up the plant. She's knocking the soil off, washing the soil off, and throwing it back at Mike, and he's planting them. So this is how three people plant several flats of plants at one at Denver Botanic Gardens. So I, I do encourage you to, to shake off the roots and then wash them off. And then use water to backfill the hole. And that way the sand, or whatever soil mix you have, has intimate contact with the roots immediately. And so the very first roots and root hairs it grows are straight into that sand, and there's no soil interface. Something I keep forgetting to ask you guys about if anyone's doing bare root planting, so I want to hear. In North, we did with trees, yeah. though. Yeah. Large trees. Indeed. And you mud them in just like that. There you go. Mud them in. Yeah. And you it. don't need yeah. a stake. Exactly. Trees this with is a stake with a ball, big ball. Yeah. You don't need a stake if you do this. Isn't that, isn't that cool? So bare root planting is the most amazing thing. It's my biggest soapbox in all of horticulture. I think everybody should do it. Bare root planting is incredible. Um, and, and so the, the, the hole is back filled with water and sand. So the water brings the sand perfectly, fills the hole without air spaces. Perfect. And the closer the rock, the closer the crevice, the happier the plant, it seems to me. 
um, strangely enough. So, so Linda's going to quickly demonstrate how to plant a uh, carnation for you. She, that was the hole I pointed out to you in the, in the early lecture. She's got, oh, she's got a, a dandelion digger. Do you guys use the dandelion diggers? She's got a dandelion digger, which she's excavated the hole out, and the sand, who knows where the sand went. It obviously can't save it. She dug the hole, and she's, she's pushing the roots down in that hole, and then filling it with her hand as a funnel in the back with sand. Her trowel's back here, so she's letting that sand go back in that hole, and there it is. But the beauty is, because it's smushed between two rocks, it's not drying out, and it's staying moist enough down in there. The other trick is when designing the crevice gardens to leave some gaping holes for some bigger plants, because we want to squish some bigger plants in there too. Um, so I'm not almost done here, you guys, but <coughs> the trick I learned from Mr. Hollebeck was uh, he, he believed some campanulas will only grow in the tightest crack possible, so he would actually split, he would take a piece of uh, slate from his crevice garden, split it open, split the rock open, I'm not joking. Then he'd take his campanula that he collected in the offices, bare root it, put it between the two. He might paint um, like a little bit of clay on there. Paint, yes, I said paint. Like paint a little bit of clay on there because it's thin film of, uh, of, of clay soil in there. And then put the rocks together like a sandwich. I'll call it the Czech sandwich technique. And then he takes that rock and puts it back in the garden. He's essentially planted a bellflower in a rock. I've never done it before because I haven't had a crevice garden with the right kind of stone, but I don't see why it wouldn't work. Um, another example is a little town, Sendia, where I'm doing a trip where the hole, you can see where the hole is, and I've already put water in there, which helps settle it a bit, and I have uh, my trowel is over here off the side, and I'm taking the trowel and taking dirt from the side of the hole and filling the hole from the side rather than pouring in from the top. And that creates perfect, perfect planting with, with intimate um, uh, root soil contact. Squish together. And then, of course, you have this hole, which if you don't fill that hole well enough, it doesn't kill the plant. And the plants, they go for those stones. They really do. And there's something about stones, and I don't fully understand all of it, but the rock that the plants like. And seeds are another legitimate way to plant them. I find I don't get it the, as good a germination, in fact, sometimes terrible from seeds, but it's a legitimate way. Um, and then you can go out in your rocky places nearby, the other side of the state, and collect plants. For me, it's not the other side of the state. It's out the back door. But now I get to grow my wild plants at home that I couldn't accommodate before. This plant I'm so obsessed with. I can finally grow a Stragos patulatus at home in a crevice garden. And finally grow Castilea integra at home. Bellflowers. I think you guys can grow bellflowers. They grow in some rocky, humid places um, in the Pontic region from the Black Sea. I know you guys can do that. Um, but I'm really excited to find out what plants suddenly you'll be able to grow in the crevice garden that you wouldn't normally grow. And you can also squish plants on top of each other. Why not? As long as they don't occupy the same airspace, you can do it. I know you can grow this. Tony Evans got it. It will definitely grow in a crevice for you then. If you can grow it in a raised berm, then a uh, Lee's Dwarf Snowball or Sneed's Dwarf Snowball. Seeds and cuttings are available. You can order them online or just email me and I'll send some to you. Um, it's an endangered species, so you're saving the world when you grow this plant. Um, I know you guys can grow that. And in crevice gardens in North America, we're not using grass yet, but I'm out there looking for miniature grasses. This thing's two inches tall to grow in a crevice garden. Why not? It'd be fun. Another paintbrush I couldn't dream of growing before. And guess what it's doing right now while I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> First time I've ever had Rimrock uh, paintbrush blooming. Gorgeous, amazing plant. Um, I really do encourage you guys to try this, even if it's just two rocks. Um, just two rocks, that's all. And to try planting some crevices in your garden and see what happens. So um, that's that for this. And I'm sorry I went 12 and a half minutes over, but thank you guys for sitting through here again. We'll go outside. I did want to mention one thing. A problem you wouldn't run into, but we would here. Yeah. The price of sand. Mm -hmm. We oftentimes sand from uh -huh. the beach sand, which is yeah. not coarse and sharp edges. Uh -huh. It's often rounded off and it's got little cracks in it. Yeah. It can hold microfauna and microflora that you don't want to introduce. Uh -huh. That's a good idea. Around, yeah. around here, what you want to get is coarse concrete sand, washed Builder concrete sand. sand. Builder sand. Builder sand. Well, most of, if you want to get it in bulk, most of them are selling it as concrete sand. Mm -hmm. I just, I just bought some in a lot of places, and I call it builder sand, and that's how they sell the bags, but in 
bulk around here. It's concrete sand mostly. So not placing. Not placing. Not Very good. That's what you said. I think, and um, Peter Korn talks about with his sand, if, it, if you can cake it together and it stays as a cake, no good. It's not sand. It should crumble. It should be crumbly. Right. You know, if it stays at all, then it's not pure sand. And you can do that, that, that glass jar technique where you put your soil with water and shake it and uh, watch it settle. And you'll be able to find out just how much sand is actually in it. Um, so, you yeah, know, you take Mark's, Mark's suggestion on that. Too. Peter spoke for a couple years ago. Well, there you go. He swam over the cross here or something. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, shall we uh, head outside or we can sit? Okay. So, welcome to the crevice garden demonstration. There's, uh, we started this crevice garden yesterday so that we had half of it to show you how we're going to start it and how we finish the crevice garden because the process is long enough that we wouldn't be able to build a whole crevice garden in one sitting. So what we did yesterday was started to pull the dirt away from the edges here um, to plant those sort of foundation, those footer stones on the outside. And uh, as, as Tim will back me up, that this little rock here, this, it appears to be very small, uh, four-fifths of it is buried. And that's, that is to, to provide support all the way up to these big guys here. Because um, this thing's relatively, you know, if, if it moved, it's going to put weight on this one, which will put weight on this one. And on, on down, we wanted to distribute the weight down to the ground and provide a buttress, if you will. So we dug out the edge fairly deeply and took this beautiful soil that uh, Tim has been working on for so many years and we're going to bury it <laughs> and um, uh, the other thing we did so we started burying those rocks deeply here some of these guys are, are pretty far underground a foot or more they're actually. just in the soil they're in the soil now the, we're actually uh, where you guys are standing is on a green roof actually and it's and it's elevated so right about here um, right right I mean at this level right here is the green roof, so we can't go further than that, and we have to fake part of this. And these are, are not hardly buried at all, but they're not very tall, so they don't have to be um, uh, sunk in order to be stable. So, um, so this is you know real deep buried crevice garden, and somewhere about here they start getting shallow, and they're they are uh, uh, supported by their neighbors. And uh, then, as you can see, we brought in sand and started piling it on top, and. Uh, we, we did backfill in here. Oh, I want to show you the backfilling business. Before we put the sand on, let me grab a shovel. Sorry, Chris. Only, this is just me personally. My favorite tool for digging holes for the crevice garden is the uh, sharpshooter post hole digger. I don't know what you call it, shovel. Narrow shovel, pipe shovel. What's that? Post hole? Drain spade. Drain spade or post hole. I really love that one. But then the non-business end of the shovel here is uh, what we use to pack the clay in down at the very base of these stones to get them firm and tight in there because there were definitely air spaces. When we dug a great big hole and put these rocks in here, the spaces between them were quite open. So we, we came back underneath of them and, and, and pushed the, uh, the topsoil back underneath of them until we were satisfied that the soil was basically at the same level it was before we came we've just sunk a bunch of rocks into it. So that, that soil level is basically the same. We did displace them by putting rocks in there. And then when we were satisfied that these were perfectly planted in the clay, we came back with our sand on top. And this is essentially what makes a crevice garden a raised bed. And it's a raised bed that doesn't have straight walls and happens to be full of sand and covered in rocks. But it's a raised bed now, isn't it? And I know that you guys here at the Ralston have a lot of beds and you've replaced all, all the soil because the heavy acid clay around here is just too much for the plant. So here's another raised bed for you guys, right? Um, let's see, what, what should I point out now? What I'll do is, um, what, what Mark was imagining for this garden was to be solid crevice, solid rock. So just imagine that this were a uh, small school bus sized rock that had been eroded and slivered down. And that's what we're trying to make it look like. So again, that, that big secret of keeping th making them look natural is keeping their faces aligned with each other. And if you guys haven't had a look at the front over here that's, that's done the first line, you have a look before you go. Um, and by tr trying to get their edges to agree with each other is, is what kept that natural look again. Uh, and I think I, I want to demonstrate that uh, in uh, placing a few more rocks. In the meantime, we can allow the sand to get into these crevices here. And bef 
um, before we have the gravel protecting the sand from erosion, um, this is a good time for us to come in with a hose and we can water in the sand. Do you want to do that, Tim? Yeah, I'll get water. And, um, so this is, yeah, this is, this is that, the lovely hot soil that Tim has been creating all these years. And now we're covering it with completely inorganic sand. And the way I figure if you do, if you did end up wanting some compost or some organic material, it's easier to add it in future than subtract. There's no way to subtract organic material. You can't, you can't take it out. So I really do think it's better to start without if you haven't decided. And it's, it's incredible what plants will grow in completely mineral situations. It really is. And one thing that I hadn't realized, and I hadn't worked with rock mines, but then when you unloaded the pallet, you put the rocks out so you could see them all. And so oh, yeah. That's, that's, that's another thing we did. It, it takes up a lot of space, and you can see how many rocks you bought. They were all laying out all over the place. Mark, you want to just walk those in and, and, uh, and stop before it goes out onto your beautiful path? Can you guys see? I mean, this, this isn't shocking or anything, but you see how quickly the water flows through that sand? That is drainage. And the other beautiful thing that happens is these rocks are gathering heat all day from the sun, so the surface of the rocks is nice and warm, and the bottoms of the rocks are nice and cool. And it creates a whole new environment that you've never had in your garden before. And now, any plants that you have killed and any plants that have grown in your garden, giving you an impression of what you can grow in your region, you got to rethink all of it again. You have a crevice garden, and it's totally brand new. Um, for some plants, I guess. You know, believe it or not, um, I, there was a gentleman in my hometown who'd heard of crevice gardens. And I said, has anybody done it here? And he says, oh no, the rocks get too hot. It's not the case. I, I guess not. Um, in the summer? Weirdly enough, in my situation, in my eight inches of precip, the, the whole rock garden is kind of like one giant, thick, extra effective mulch, keeping the soil moist and cool down below. So the top might get hot and really dry, but the roots are all the way down there to the clay. How hot does it get where you are? We get 110 for several weeks. Yeah, but you guys are humid, which is a little different, and the plant's ability to transpire, I actually think that... You cool down at night. We cool down at night, and sometimes it's only down to 85 degrees, but um, I, th I think the hot rocks may help for you guys. The, the hot rocks will probably keep the local environment drier, so the plant's ability to evapotranspirate and cool itself may be increased. This is something we don't know. You guys are right on the cusp of a totally new thing to try out. It's cutting edge, I guess, but it's up to you. I don't live here. So, um, okay. would you recommend coarser sand and French drains around the perimeter? Um, you know, if you heavy if, red clay soil. You know, if, if you think that your drainage off the rock garden will be so much that you'll have excess water yeah, on the end. We can have down heavy down. You course. could you could do that. You yeah. could do that. Uh, again, think of it as a big rock. And what's going to happen with a big rock or a house is the water comes off the sides and drains. Yeah, now here he, they've got a path which is going to drain the water away. So that's that's up to you how you how well you want to do that. Here's um, put more water. Yeah, uh, just in a, in a second. So so uh, these guys are lucky enough to actually have a slate of some sort which is actually breakable. So leftover rocks will be able to sliver up. And um, you can already see there's a variety of planting hole sizes here. Now, um, this would probably be unsustainable if we just put sand in this rock. This, this crevice here is big enough I can reach my hand into it. Um, I think what I'd wind up wanting to do is put a sliver like this. And then, uh, if you can, um, I've started using a rubber mallet. I really love the rubber mallet just to sink it in. That's all right. Um, and, and you can knock it in there. You can use your, your shovel like a rubber mallet. Yep. You're, you'll forgive me, Mark. So, uh, what I'd be tempted to do is this, and that's more to just provide a little more stability. Because in the end, we're going to wind up putting, um, gonna wind up putting uh, gravel on top. I've never used this before. So has anyone read about Stephanie Ferguson in Calgary? Yeah. She's a, a crevice gardener. She has, she has 50 tons of rock. Mm. That's four dump trucks <laughs> of stone from her local quarry. It took her a whole year to place all of it. Her place looks like a shark's mouth. It's all these rocks standing up, but she grows stuff no one else, has, almost no one else has grown. Like the rostulate vial is from the end. Nobody can grow those, but she's got them. She's got them. Um, she, why did I bring her up? 
you're amazing. Nice. But you're she, she, she uses <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> the audience keep me in line. She uses a table knife. I've never used it before, but um, I can see why. Um, so her table knife allows her to uh, to get in those crevices, and I guess it, she's had this one knife for many years, and, and it's her favorite now. Tim, you want to wash the sand in a sure. little deeper? Um, okay, now now I'll tell you my sob story about my favorite tool. This is a, a widger or a knit picker or a dibbler, something called a dibbler, which is for planting seedlings, transplanting seedlings or bulbs. I had one that was bigger, longer, and had a handle on it that I bought in Wisley in the UK. And uh, I got into the airport with it and realized I didn't check it in. Oh, no. And I, I saw the TSA guy and I said, I have a shovel. I don't know if they're not going to like it. A gardening shovel. And he says, a shovel? Let me, let me see the shovel. And he looks at it and he goes, oh my god. He says, you, you got to go to the beginning. So um, I couldn't check it on. I either missed my airplane or uh, or throw away the widger. So I lost my widger. <laughs> but uh, I, I guess I can order it online and get another one. It was a great tool for, especially the handle, made it a lot less cumbersome. This might be the, the biggest thing that a lot of folks have trouble with is the planting, that you're not using a big spade anymore to garden with. You're using a flipping table knife, which is ridiculous, but it's working. And, it, and you, you'll probably adopt your own fun methods and whatnot. That's, that's a pretty nice little space there. I like that. Yeah, all kinds of questions. Well, that's a good idea. It's a really good idea. So, so we have this nice little crevice started here with a hole and, and you guys can see you want to look how deeply I'm able to make a hole in there um, just with, with this actually and I'm sure I could get one even deeper with this um, do we have any of that gravel nearby Mr. Yeah. Tim? and if you have a crevice garden have this guy help yeah. my goodness he just told me he's going to the chiropractor so it's okay <laughs> it's not it's, uh, I, I think we ought to uh, I want to mulch it just so you can see what it's like planting in a mulched area. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at that. Oh, that is just the right, the right stuff. Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, going with that natural aesthetic of, of do you want something to look natural, like a single eroded stone? Um, going with the same color stone for gravel is ideal. If you really had your druthers, a stone crushed of the same rock you're using to make the garden would be, that would be the cat's meow. But you don't always have that option. So color, you know, you can go for color. Oh, and that's beautiful, you guys. Look at that. Do you, you guys want to have a look at that before I plant it up and, and destroy it by putting a flower in it? It's, uh, you guys can see uh, the look of this garden. So then in the end, none of the sand will show in the garden. And I, I'm starting sorry, to think that sorry. thicker the, the gravel, the better. And I, I'll be honest, it's, it's a pain to, to or it's different to planting gravel. You have to scoop the gravel aside, so get over it. <laughs> You'll be growing plants no one else can grow, so, so just go for it. Um, and it's possible. So there's one way to deal with it, is uh, scoop the gravel aside. I'm going to recreate my nice little hole. Have a nice deep hole in my sand now. Wow, that's so much butter. That's so fun. I'll play with it later. It's a big sandbox. It is. I'll be a kid again. This is a uh, pencil and bike color from around Las Vegas. So good luck, you guys. I've never grown it before. It's got pretty fuzzy bike colors. Not bike colors, but pink and white. Yeah, so, I need some water. So why, why did you put it in the sand and then put the gravel? Um, I only wanted to do that to show you as possible to scrape the, the gravel aside. If you have time to do it, great. Plant in the in it before you put the gravel on. I actually find it easier to talk dress the garden before I plant it because if it starts to rain, right. the rain will will carry the sand away, and and also. Also, a, the gravel mixing in with the sand of it is okay. Um, be before I plant this, I'll tell you that one of the, the main concepts of crevice gardening, this is a physics concept, is that what we're doing in a, in a very overarching 
conceptual thing is, is arranging mineral pieces, that's rocks <laughs> for the, the rest of us, is arranging rocks from their biggest size, something this big that Tim and I need to work on together, to their smallest size, which is clay. In between is sand and gravel, but it's arranging particle size from the biggest rocks to the chips, to the gravel, to the sand, to the clay. So the particle size is literally going from this to uh, um, um, microns. Is that what, how big a, a plate lid of uh, clay is? Tiny. But what that does is allows the plant to choose where it wants to grow. You see? A rock like this is not going to wash away. In, I don't care how much rain you guys get, I know that that's not going anywhere. Um, that's a little different for these things. So that's the big secret. Is, is arranging particle size from biggest to smallest. Um, and if any of you take the NARGS quarterly from the National Club, um, Stephanie up in Calgary wrote two articles. I forget which ones they were. Bobby can uh, point them out to you. But she wrote two articles, and one of them really described that graduation where she start, she has gravel, sand, or gravel, and a gravel-sand combination, and then silt, and then clay. So she has this complete arrangement. Um, now we have our poor plant, who has been volunteered to do this, who didn't even ask if they wanted to come first plant. to North Carolina. Good luck, my friend. We're not in Vegas. <laughs> the first plant. What, what happens in Vegas might get collected by a plant collector and taken to North Carolina. I think that's how the phrase goes. Um, and so, uh, let's see. I think, uh, will you uh, come with the water sure. and we'll... Come on. Um, Let's see, not yet, actually, or, sorry. Or after. How about after? Yeah, after. So I'm just taking it slow. So I've gotten really fast at planting things in Carvis Gardens, and I usually walk around with one bucket for soil and one bucket of water. And I wash it and So we and take more it. soil off. What's that? Yeah, actually, let's, let's take more soil off. Let's do that just for what you do. There you go. Blast it. Take it away. How many of you guys bear root plants? Like, you guys just scuff up your plants pretty well before you plant them, or can you yeah. throw them at the ground? And you, know, try to get you, you don't bear root them, but you do scuff up the, yeah. the root ball pretty well. It's not going to get all the through. We find in, in Colorado, because we are so dry, that when we do this to a plant, it freaks it out a little bit more. But as soon as it starts growing, it establishes like this. Sometimes it, it skips a whole year in establishing. It goes so much faster, because it doesn't have to grow out of the root ball. So I plant everything like this, except maybe tomatoes. I grow everything like this now. Um, and in western Colorado especially, I have to put a shade cloth. So I have little little fabric tents, which my, my mom and I get together and have a daughter-son moment. <laughs> we sew these little squares together into tents, and I put the tent on them. And that seems to help tremendously. Um, with my experiments over the last two years, one week with the tent seems to be the, the difference. After a week, it does, they don't seem to notice after I take it off. Because I think within a week, roots have grown already. And it's already established in a way. So here's here's our hole. You saw the hole. And um, one way to do it is I, I could just lay it out on the knife and then just serve it up like a pizza in an oven <laughs> and pull the knife out. That's one way to do it. If it was a tighter crevice, I could stuff uh, carefully so you don't break off part of the root ball, but I could stuff it in there um, and let it in. Um, another way would be to, uh, I know you guys love Chinese take. Now these are these are uh, Ralston Ralston takeout chopsticks. <laughs> this is, these, are, these are made specially here at the, the, the uh, Ralston Arboretum, um, and uh, you know a chopstick allows you to pinch it so it doesn't get stuffed in the top, and you can actually get it down there and push it down. Um, for really skinny things, once or twice I've uh, sort of twirled the roots around the chopstick, um, and the water makes them stick. And then if you twist the chopstick the other way. It'll let it go. Um, for a really skinny, long taproot, the twirling chopstick is what a friend decided to call it. Um, and that works. But uh, I think it's just about time we, we plant this poor penstemon. I have high hopes for this penstemon. You guys have to tell me how it goes. So what I've done is it's laying in the hole. And the hole is this angle, by the way. It's not a straight hole. The angle angle's about 45 degrees. Um, and now, um, I think what I'd start with is a little bit of water. You want to dribble water right at the entrance of that hole. No, that's perfect. You see how it's kind of, it's collapsed the hole, now pull it away. Actually, that just planted it. It's done. 
Um, I didn't expect it to work that well, but uh, so what it's done is just collapsed the hole in on the roots. So now the roots are in perfect sand, just like that, like that. No, no question about it. And I think just for aesthetics, I might actually pile up the sand and the gravel a little bit higher and uh, level it off. And now we have Penstemon bicolor in uh, North Carolina. Good the luck. The first planting. What's that? The first planting. The first Sorry. plant. Yay. And the curve is coming now. Um, let's see, should we plant any more just, just for the heck of it? I have some stuff here. Oh, cool. This is where the yeast planted. It's starting yeah. to oh, wow. flower and it's, it's starting to brown out. The green. How about Polytrica? That one. Cool. <laughs> yeah, let's let's give that a go. Do you, do you want to uh, do the wash the roots off? Yeah. And I'll uh, Tim, are these make sure we've got enough seeds. No. These are one plants I got last yeah. month. Most of these, some, I got a few things from Paniote, some from Denver, uh, Botanic Garden, uh, and uh, some from. Uh, I, I do relax. notice that sand, when you, after you water it, settles a lot. Are these hard sand sitting dry, so so sand sitting in wet. Just, cool. It's a, a lot warm, of settling, so yeah, I, I can see that really we ought to water this pretty well before we continue uh, placing rocks. What I'm more concerned about is, is there sand in that whole crevice? I can plant that easily enough, but I want to make sure there's actually soil underneath of it. Otherwise, it's going to be very high and dry. Yeah, the, the bottom hasn't filled in, so I'm going to skip that one. This, let's see. Yeah, we don't quite have these full enough. We need some more sand. Sand enough. Yeah, I need to, um, I'll, I'll wash some sand in if you want to. Or... Where do you want it? <laughs> Um, let's fill up, let's start filling up this crevice here and see if we can't get that settled in there. Yeah, use the, the upper one, there's two valves there. One doesn't go. That's okay. See what happens and it will happen in a rainstorm if you don't cover it, it will just wash away. But for now, this is our, our technique of getting the sand deep in the crevices. Yeah, it is, and it's, it's quite open on the bottom, so I think what I might want to do is... Yeah, exactly. That is perfect gravel for this thing. Are there any of you guys who think you might want to try making a little crevice garden at home? See what you can pull off? I'm curious. Yeah. I'm, I'm very curious with your uh, climate here. Just, just what all you can pull off. We're not sure yet. You, we don't. We don't know. You know. All this stuff may end up in the bucket. You never know. You never know. Like we Probably. said before, let let the Ralston Arboretum kill plants so before you invest in the farm. I think. Uh, I'm still not satisfied that that crevice is full enough. So, actually, maybe let's can we fill this one from the back? The oh, front? Tim! Yeah, let's have it. <laughs> it's a lot easier when you have the whole crevice done. You can just wash the whole darn thing. You know, it's a lot easier. And normally, you'd be doing all the filling and then come back and plant. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. We're we're having to catch up a little bit. Yeah. Well, we could take four or five rocks and just make a little one. Yeah. In a bed you already have. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you saw like that one with the eight stones. Yeah, right? Yeah. Oh, there, goes, there goes that one in the back. Oh, yeah. it's coming. Oh. Actually, it's, uh, this is where definitely some rocks yeah. and the uh, yeah. sand is going to help. There you go. It's all right. And actually, since this is big enough, that, that also needs to have a sliver in there somewhere. This is not the sliver for that. But, um, uh, how small is the sliver? Um, or how uh, big is the finger, finger width. Oh. Yeah. Is that big enough or not? Not big enough. Okay. Yeah, let's see. I think. Oh, there we go. Let's do it. Those, the rest of the crevice garden is just not good. Which actually makes me think we ought to, uh, maybe ought to build a bit on top. Okay. 
um, I want to plant that drab up, but since these crevices aren't filled with sand, I'll probably they're right. Okay. So just toss them back in. So uh, I want to do a little bit of building for you guys to give you an idea what it's like to work with stone. I recommend gloves. So rocks that are uh, uh, slivering, fragmenting rocks can get pretty dang sharp. I mean, sharp as glass. So wear gloves. Use tools to keep yourself healthy. And, um, what I'm going to look at is all these faces and decide how I want the next run of rocks to be. We planted this one deciding that somewhere up here it's going to get fairly tall. So the next rock Line it up like so. It's obviously not stable, right? It's not, uh, but it's gonna have friends around it. Let's see. I don't actually fully like that. No. If, if there is an area where you wonder if stability is a problem, just go ahead and, and bury. Um, really tall stone. You know, like this guy. He's... Not very satisfied with that, the way they meet each other there. And this is where you can drive yourself nuts and take lots of time and take a coffee break, complain to your spouse a little bit, then go back outside. <laughs> That's, that looks a lot better, doesn't it? You, you guys see what's going on there? I'm trying to, like this face, kind of parallel to this face, you know? Now, later we got another trick if, uh, so that rock, I really haven't compacted the soil under it. I don't know how stable it is. But you'll notice when you um, go ramming sand, do you see the stone lifting? Watch really closely. The, This is where it's good to be washing in and um, rinse water, pounding sand. Not at this point, I think I'll, I'll wait. I want to arrange a handful of rocks so you guys can see how that works. And um, you can see I'm generally keeping the strata in this, this sort of, golly, I didn't even know. I'm keeping it parallel, generally. It's going to arc slightly as it gets to the top? Yeah, I think it'll arc slightly, and that'll change the microclimate a little by little. And then on this side, it'll be sloping down, much like that side, and be in shadow for more of the year, and create a cooler soil. The top of the plant could be in the sun, but the ground isn't getting sun. Mm -hmm. Yet another microclimate. And uh, the nice thing about sand is just how easy it is to work with. It's flexible. You can pull some away, put the rock deeper, push it away, the rock's higher. Um, then the other thing you can do is we don't know where this crevice garden is going in future. Is it getting taller? Is it getting shorter? You can sketch it as, if you will, just kind of sketch the general um, contours of it with other stones. Maybe, maybe I want another hill over here so I can plop in a rock just to remind me. Oh yes, when it comes down, I want it high again so that I have this low spot before south facing for another microclimate. And in, in an ideal world, we would have done the whole outside first um, so that you know where you're going. Because it's really hard to come from the top and start going underground. I've done that and it's ridiculous. Because then you're trying to backfill rocks that are already buried under rocks. And it's, it's just silly. It's totally silly. So this, is, this is a way to sketch um, your features. And then you can decide before they're a big feature in your garden whether you really want to commit to, uh, to uh, creating the crevice garden over there. Hmm. In the meantime, let's uh, keep placing these bad boys. Yeah. How much stone did you bring in? Yeah. Well, what was the tonnage on this stone? How many? Yeah. Two tons. Two tons. This is, so what you see behind you and okay. for now. Right out there. Leave it there. You're not coming out Here, that's two tons <laughs> and these as well. Wow. You'll, you'll be amazed That'd how much stone you can eat up. When you look at a pallet, you can kind of estimate 
if you took that palette as a cube and kind of folded it out, what it's going to look like, um, taking up that much space. Here is there's another run of stone right there. Like a tie stone. What's that? Like a tie stone that you normally. That horizontal bed, you have to put tie stones in that reach further. You, you so you're could. adding strength to it by putting that extra. I am, exactly. Like this stone is wobbly and well, well actually, yeah. I buried that deeply. This stone is very wobbly. But by putting these on either side of it, um, let's just keep building it and then we'll step on it and show you that it's pretty, pretty strong. And here's another thing that happens is when the rocks settle into each other, they tend to kind of pinch each other. You see the, the edge of this one like that? It's going to squish it into its neighbor. That's a secret way of keeping these guys all together and not falling apart over the years. And so there's sort of usually two stages of sand that I have in construction. You know, when I'm building one of these big guys, I have to be organized. And um, the two stages of sand is one is the sort of basic layer of sand that I can move around, put the rocks in. And then when that's covered, it'll look a lot like this. And the stones will all be there, but the crevices won't be filled. So usually I'll wash down that first layer, then bring in some more sand and fill my crevices. So it's and what? Like, it's pinched at the front and so separated at the back. Would it be good to put a little gravel to, to keep that uh, a narrow wedge it forms? Because by forming a narrow wedge, you can form, I uh, get more tighter and tighter space as you go front, allowing more variation. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, it, you know, it's those inconsistencies like this little wedge crevice that Richard was talking about that allow you to plant. You know, the next rock that comes might actually be flush or close to this one, but in the meantime, there's a crevice. So I build things as though they're bricks, but these are not bricks. They're so irregular. And it's the imperfections that you can plant it. You can see just how nice and easy the the sand is to uh, to work with. It's just a <coughs> convenient endeavor. Now, in the meantime, here's here's a crevice in profile. If you want to look at it from from over here, you can imagine when we have this crevice um, full like that. That's good. And you guys want to? I'll uh, I want to bunch everybody up over there. But if you if you want to come over here, I'll show you the profile of a crevice, the sort of invisible man crevice, if you will. So there's, there's a crevice from the side. And when I remove this rock, you can see what's going on here. That's a big fat planting hole for a dwarf conifer or easy to get bulbs. And I warn you, some bulbs love the crevice garden. And if they're really aggressive bulbs, it could be a pain to remove. So be careful with what bulbs you plant. Make sure you really love those bulbs because they can be really hard if they start growing under the rocks and reseeding everywhere. Bulbs are, could be a real pain. You might find yourself painting the pesticides on their leaves trying to kill them. You know you what this move. strikes me a lot as? It's like a musical composition in terms of all the different aspects working together and all the multi-dimensional aspects. Really funny you bring that up. The last uh, crevice garden, that four and a half ton, for the shins. He's a composer. And we were talking about uh, composition when uh, we were building his garden and he had a blast. Mm -hmm. He wasn't so sure at first, but um, so th there's a crevice. There's a fat spot there. We'll definitely want little dams in here to keep the gravel and the sand from moving over the years. Um, let's uh, keep a little like jazz. There's an improv improvisation. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. What's a dam? Oh, a, a dam. Yeah, that's a, so, uh, if you look at it from this side, when I have this filled with sand, you can imagine that the water is going to accumulate there and try to flow out. So it'll be good to have some gravel or some chips right at the surface here, simply because there's kind of a bottleneck of water when you guys have a, a heavy storm. Would you want a vertical small piece of stone there? Sure, that'd be great. Or, or a pipe of gravel? What's that? Or a pipe of gravel? A pipe of gravel. Something, so in other words, so you, it could a place that would go down deeper. Oh, I some, see. You could do that. Like I'm sure the sand will find its way into the gravel. Yeah. But yes, um, like right here, I can promise you that sand would wash out here. So if yeah. we could get something vertical-ish, maybe I'll uh, like something shaping like a... There's a little over here. Are there chips? Oh, yeah. Got it. 
Oh, nice. So here's, uh, this is a good example because, um, well, it's not very big. Now, if it's a little bit smaller, if I could shove something down in there. Nice. Really nice. So you guys are getting into it. Look at you. Is, um, can you see how this is wedging in there? That would stop the sand and gravel from moving right there. I do stuff like this. There we go. We'll come back and place that. Now, uh, I'll just keep keep sketching it. Here's, here, there's another trick is for stability. Um, if you've got side to side, say, say these were built up on either side and there was a lot of for force coming from either side, I would stick a little guy like this in the middle if you wanted to keep this fat and open for a big generous crevice. That way these two rocks could pinch together, the mound would be stable, and you'd still have that open space. So anytime you are tempted to have that missing brick of, of rocks in there, there ought to be one in there to fulfill its engineering requirements and let there be a hole for your Daphne or whatever you're going to wind up planting. But uh, I think I'd like to just keep placing some rocks. Now you can see this guy sitting on top of that other rock. I obviously have to have something on this side keep it there, or it's just going to uh, slip off, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Let's see. Might actually, I'm looking at that one, but it'll take a moment to uh, plant. <laughs> Oops, there it goes. There's an instance where I can use this rock and sink it. Understanding everything so far? You have any questions or um, wanted to uh, flesh in a little bit more form for you to uh, to see how form can be achieved? Can I mention one thing, Kenton? Yeah. Just from yes, yesterday when Kenton was installing this, a lot of these down low are buried deeply, and this yeah. one on the end, I wouldn't actually get out here when they buried it, but they were telling me this is a big vertical piece and you can see there's only you know a third of it le or less a so fifth the of it so the anchor, yeah. felt that deep. above ground so that's really buried because all the pressure is pushing mm -hmm. this way and that's holding up a lot of that indeed, and, indeed. This, how many rocks do you need like that two or three with that um, depth? on the end you know as many as possible um mm -hmm. i let's see because if it's only one that well that weight well a lot of these yeah. are buried very deeply if that I, were to, I think i would just barely be comfortable walking away from this crevice garden today with all the weight on that little guy um i know that mark's going to continue or, or mark and tim are going to continue building and probably have more out here that will take some of that weight because right now when this rock is leaning against that rock all that weight's going down to that little guy there and it'll hold quite a bit but i don't want to put it all there i want that weight to be distributed out into the ground where um where it can handle it Now, just the, the fun thing, the kind of artistic side of arranging is sometimes a rock can really give you an inspiration for where the garden's going to go. You know, uh, for instance, that's the edge of the garden. Maybe uh, when I put this rock here, it suggests another hill, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Going up, it's kind of low and then high again. But uh, in the end, I don't think I'm going to use this one. Not there, at least. Right, they don't have to be no. stable or backed up or whatever. We're just placing them and then we'll fill the sand in I don't really like the look of any of those, it's just not 
There we go. What do you think of that? Yeah. Is that yeah, any better? better? There we go. Perfect. That one's working really well. The sand is totally like playing in a sandbox. I just <laughs> shove it in wherever I want it. This must get interesting with towards the end of the building when you've got fewer stones to choose exactly, from. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then more specific spots you have to fill. This is where it's a lot easier to work from the sides and build to the middle. And, a, and another trick I want to share with you is the stability and flexibility of, let's see, say we're doing our, um, our see-through crevice model again. Let's say we have rocks as part of a crevice garden. So our standing up like so, maybe. And I'm trying to fill this void. The best rock I could find is a wedge of some sort because when you place a wedge like this gravity is bringing it downwards and notice where the weight's going there's weight obviously going to the bottom but there's also weight going on the outside this is the, the something i learned from stephanie up there in calgary was that these wedge-shaped rocks they stay there the neighbors hold them right so i think my little hole's too wide but when it starts to get to the edge of the garden um, or the end of the garden you have a few stones harder to find these wedge-shaped rocks to work their ways in to complete the line like that. Now you can see the gravity-wise is sitting on, on either side and there's even, when these are locked in, there will be little gaps here that I can plant plants in. Speaking of which, I think uh, I ought to do another little planting of another plant. Would you guys like to see another planting just for... for for, uh, Ooh, ah. <laughs> Here's that little drab. So actually, oh yeah, the drab. Uh, I think Tim, you and I might have to replant some of these after we've settled the sand in, but, but I do want to demonstrate. So yeah, let's, let's have that drab. And uh, I've lost my tool. This is where it was nice to have a handle on it. <laughs> right there underneath you. Right there, right there, down there as well. I still can't see. Oh, there it is. It's reflecting the color. It's camouflage. All right. So ideally you want a circle of rocks that are nice and deep and then you just work to the center. Exactly, exactly. That's, that is ideal, absolutely ideal, stability wise. You will work from the ground up. So, I, I, I just got a couple of gravel from you. Drabas. I didn't see a drab at 20 hours, so I think it has a few. There's hope. Not all these little drabas one can handle humidity. Most of them can't pronounce it. Never heard of it. Water. Uh, yeah, so with this guy, I guess, I guess the best way for him is just to shove him in. Where is it native to? A little plant? The drabas? Oh, golly. They're for they're from everywhere. Which species was that? That was, uh, mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> Drabas are all over the northern hemisphere. Poly, uh, polystrica. Polystrica. Polytrica. Or polytrica. Um, I have no idea where that was from. 90% of the Drabas are yellow, and 90% of them are yellow cushions, but they're all over alpine, yeah. mostly alpine. I think there's a desert one or two. But. So it could work in Asheville, maybe, but not here. Another one of those? You know, you probably do better. Are you in Asheville? No, I'm here. Oh, you're here. But, uh, right where I'm I, I bet, I bet by and large, Drabas do better in Asheville, but uh, because they're so diverse and come from so many different places, I bet the coastal range Drabas, um, there's a species. There's native species in the east. Yeah, yeah. there's probably even annual species, maybe even bogs. Well, so, um, yeah, uh, Tim, let's... Let's wash that one in. Just turn it up a little bit. Here goes our sand. That's good. Charlie, you get to take care of this? But you know, it's going to stay like that. You're going to build it. I end over there. His line is right here. So he laughs. Yeah. <laughs> the fridge is standing on the edge and scoff. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's dead. There you go. Oh, actually, um, can we get that bag of gravel and demonstrate the water being prevented from washing away with gravel? Yeah, let's do that. So I want to give you guys a little demonstration about the uh, the erosive prevention properties of gravel. Yeah, we're gonna have to do a lot of that. Here. 
gravel cup and I'm going to just kind of, I don't know, just dribble it on there or do a splash and go back and forth. Watching a spree being made. I thought that's it. We're, we're making your own. This spree. is the erosion plate tectonics. Going to turn it off. There you go. See what's what's wound up happening is where we were getting a heavy dribble. It just barely started to to nick into the gravel, and and it was washing it away here. That's um that's why you have gravel top dress, and and use and be generous with it. It just slows down the water and makes it slow down and percolate around all the. Uh, for these tight areas, have you ever seen fog at nozzles? They're like a glass yes. piece with three yeah. you have different sizes of sure. mist. You could use Something those. for working through these fine areas where you can control the, intent, the intensity yeah. of the glass and the mist size that would and work. volume. Boy, that might work. be a good thing to, I, to experiment with some of these. Small I think that would work. I'm too lazy. I, yeah. I tend to just wash it and if something blasts out a crevice or two, yeah. then I'll collect that and put it in there and then keep adding till it stays. It all stays. depends on how fine you want to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not a fine gardener for yeah. sure. So, uh, yeah. Well, uh, does anyone have any questions? You want to see something else demonstrated? And so, uh, so if you're feeling that cup of sweet tea at home calling you, then you can escape to it. So you, you would do, you do your outside ones and then you would kind of fill the center with sand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, then build up and then start working from the outside in on top of the sand mm -hmm. and adding sand if I need to to get higher and higher okay. until the last ones are placed in the top um, and are these, or thereabouts. The, the ones on the end here, mm -hmm. they're very deep like this. They, ideally, they are, but <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> they're, they're, oh, that's so, because so we had to get yeah. clever. So what will you do there? Just fill in with rock and. Um, yeah, what we're going to do is do a really shallow crevice, okay. and, and it'll be these really, um, the really Small shallow ones. rocks. Yeah. These, these rocks don't go down, but a few inches, uh -huh. and but they're not going anywhere because there's they're not that high. What are you going to do on the back end? How are you going to make it? Are you going to leave it very angular, and, and are you going to slope it down too? You know, that's that's up to, to Mark. He's going to build that. But, uh, <laughs> but you, <laughs> you, you could you can. have a big angle. So you like could have flip. a big angle. It, yeah. It's easier to have vertical, vertical um, perpendicular to the rock strata like this. It's easier to have that than to make the angle go this way. And can you you can see why in construction here. Otherwise, you have sort of uh, um, unavoidable wedding cake of boom, 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 boom as it drops into the ground. But it, you can do that. That's legitimate. There's a, a garden I saw when I was out a month ago, uh, Sandy Snyder's, which I think Oh, uses. yes. She yeah. has a, a stone about this tall. One big. It, it, one big stone. Oh, man. It drops to the ground. Yeah. It would just yeah. save a lot of stone if you're limited. You could do like a half moon instead you of could. a whole mound. Yes. And what I love about like a half moon shaped garden is instead of doing a circle of rocks to begin with and then working towards the middle you have the half moon like a, uh, a horseshoe and then work up and the convenient thing for a builder like me is that you just keep building till you run out of stone because it's working into a bed somewhere but I think Mark you talked about wanting to have paths through here or something or well it's, um, it's up I mean, that's, to you that's, yeah that, that's not gonna happen in soon. future <laughs> um, yeah Are you gonna do so, this whole bed as a as soon as it's funded. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for funding. Hint, hint, hint. There you go. Your name could be here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On a stone edge. Um, yeah, and, and, and that's that's another thing I didn't bring up in the lecture is that a crevice garden doesn't need to be the only feature in the area. Um, can you guys see how it would be possible, like if structurally you really were capable and brought the cliff down and sunk it into the ground? plenty of stability, and then had an open bed next to it, so you could have big pockets. Yeah, yeah, like um, so you, you could you, just have a line going right yeah, through that area. Like okay. Exactly. Oh, you can get really artistic with this stuff. Yeah. You can go nuts. And what I like about it is I can use it as sort of a retaining wall. Like, what if the soil were up here? Can you imagine an open garden bed here, and you had trees or grass or whatever, and then this the crevice garden was the retaining wall? You could do that. And, and really few people have experimented with this, so the sky's the limit, literally. There's probably not a magic line, but, you know, we all know what crevice means. Yeah. But if, if the spacing gets, quote, too wide, is it 
no longer a crevice wow. garden, you know. You know, I mean, the, plants, or... the plants still benefit from yeah. the roots being trained down, even yeah. if all of the crevices are the same size, like this far apart, the roots still have a certain advantage and the rocks are still mulching the soil. It is my personal belief that unless it is as, as rocky as possible, you're not pushing that effect that the rocks have to the full extent of their capability. Nature wouldn't so. put those spaces evenly done, so no, we shouldn't no. either. And uh, I think in, in Zizi's book he says, uh, two centimeter crevices everywhere. Which, <laughs> that's great if you could do that. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so I actually tried to shoot for having a complete rock. And as I said, the imperfections and my inability with something not shaped like a brick, those imperfections is where the plants get to go. And uh, they wind up leave, leaving me with big spots occasionally little spots here and there and and I think that's part of the challenge too it doesn't end when you're done putting the rock and then the challenge is where do I stick that plant mm -hmm. you know, how do I get that in there you know you start poking around and decide well I at least went on the south side so then you keep poking until you find a spot that works for it you know what way of how many like if you have two tons of rock yeah you need one ton of sand or, oh you know, golly you know, um, that just play it by ear it depends on what the existing features are too you know yeah. if um, like uh, we, we, had, we had a bit of clay topsoil yeah. from the edge that yeah. came and filled this mess. Yeah. I don't really have a good formula. Yeah. I think on average I've been using about half my weight in in sand. About on average, you know, for for four tons of rocks, about two tons or, or a little uh, more than two yards of, of sand. About or right, yeah, half, so about half. How would you put a tree in here? A small a tree. A small a tree. A little tree. I well, I think I'd pick a like, place like yeah. this. How? At the top. Um, it's, it's aesthetically up to you. Um, I did make a crevice garden for a lady and then she planted a dwarf conifer in front of it, which that's, that's her, it's her garden. She can really do it, but I don't think I'd want to have covered up the, these rocks from the view from her pathway. Um, you know, I like seeing them at the edge. The nice thing about a crevice garden is it's this big mass with, with real visual weight. And to have another shrub next to it that's maybe bigger, a little smaller, or even the same size, that's big and massive and has a, another visual way. I like having big stuff nearby, but to have something right on top of it does hide your rocks, so I don't like to put, unless they're really tiny, like a little, like a little uh, juniperus compressa could be fun right in there. Um, and if a gallon plant, uh, you could fit a gallon, number one size nursery pot, um, bare rooted, I bet you could fit it in here. I think you'd want to go ahead. put a tree like dead center with a funny. No, and, and, and only in my opinion. Well, yeah, my That's, opinion. Yeah, <laughs> only in my opinion would that look silly. Yeah. What, what, I was wondering about soil types. When people collect, and you mm -hmm. take pictures and you have something aesthetic in the uh, side of the rock, but isn't the so rock type and soil type and the exposure something that they should take field notes on? Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. if you've got alkaline or acidic yeah. soils, yeah. and certain types of rock leach different me heavy metals sure. like iron and aluminum sure. and things like that. Because you, you wouldn't want to put a, a desert limestone or gypsaceous plant in an acidic in acidic soil. Absolutely. Good, good, uh, good plant hunters in their field notes will put, you know, limestone crevices. Well, yep. it probably wants drainage and probably wants alkaline and soil. And probably plant associations as well, like whether yeah. pine oak and the high at certain elevations. Sure. All of that, that stuff, stuff is very great. helpful for trying for in, in building and selecting the plants to grow Absolutely. in. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that does help in the rock garden. Now, I mean, what's the north side of a mountain for us in Colorado, because it's so much drier and hotter there, might be the north side of, of a rock garden for you. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking Louisias. I, I really just, from how I feel this place, I feel like you should try the Louisias on the mm -hmm. south side and see what they do because that south side will warm up and drain and dry out a lot quicker than the north side will. I mean, I, I expect the north side will probably get a little bit of moss on that side um, in the future. Yeah, I think, for instance, I always look at comparing scaling things down like mountain ranges yeah uh, in the in the in the south and the east the sun comes up it warms up and then afternoon it stay it cools off so there's a more even even temperature range whereas in the south and the west side it's cold sure. and it shoots way up so you got more like a desert arid desert side on the south on the on the on the west side and more like a like a oh like Japanese or European or English style Absolutely. environment on the other side. And, um, Stephanie's so the orientation and Stephanie's the angle rock which, garden up in Calgary and, and her article describes how the she has sort of three ridges of crevice garden in her front yard and then the bottom is all Asian stuff, Chinese, 
and then the middle tends to be Europe, and then the top tends to be Western North America. That's what Wojciech has too. Yeah, he does he really? Mm -hmm. No kidding. Yeah. Well, there's, it works. Yeah. It works. It works. Well, to follow up on what Richard was saying, would you tend to orient your rocks, you know, north, south, east, west, or of course in this case, yeah. at um, an angle, or to take your pick, really? You really can take your pick because I think um, there, 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 there is uh, ostensibly a lot more crevices straight on with the strata, ostensibly. But at the same time, say when, when, we, when we turn this into a crevice right here on this southeast face, right there, the orientation is different, but it's facing southeast and it's, um, it's still a crevice. You know what I mean? Doesn't doesn't matter which way the strata or the roots is, are going, but it's still a crevice facing one direction. Um, and I think I, it depends on the kind of stone. If you have, um, if you had a really chunky, blocky stone, and you had its broad side facing the west, say like today, if you had a really chunky stone, there'd be less crevices facing west than facing uh, these, the other directions, right? That's something to think about. And aesthetically, I personally like to not have it straight on with, with nature, because we're already doing that with our buildings. That's great. And this is supposed to look natural, but that's only my own aesthetic. I think it's completely legitimate if someone wanted to come along and make a cube. <laughs> Why not? That, that'd be fun. Someone should do that. Th that sphere was pretty darn cool. <laughs> Talk about microclimates. A sphere. Sure. I'm not sure who. It was Vert. Uh, I can't think of his last name. Uh, Gert, Vert. Anyway, Vert. There was a Dutch fellow who did this sphere uh, out of out of recycled the, concrete. We saw them. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. Is that George who did that? Yeah, I think it's right. Yeah. Anyway, are there any other questions? I want to end it so that you guys can go home if you want to, and others can hang around and watch while we play some more stones and wash things in. Any last questions? Well, thank you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.